Great. So I will start talking about this medical imaging for a patient with a headache. Now, um, the outline of a really talk is really about imaging of the headache when imaging is necessary. Not everybody with a headache need imaging. So when do you consider imaging? And assuming you will be, could be internal medicine doctor, could be a headache specialist or neurology, or could be primary care, could be neurosurgeon. But I think that people have a different kind of perspective on when to use imaging uh, for a patient with a headache. And also if you decided to order imaging, what kind of study to choose from? And then there are quite a bit of options. Um, and then we will have some quick Q&A. If you have any question, you can type in a chat uh, if you like, or just speak up and then turn on the microphone. And I was told to show some quiz at the end, okay? So the problem of the headache, because a headache is such a common clinical complaint. For general neurology clinic, as well as a primary care, general internal medicine, uh, even emergency room, a lot of people with headache will show up in your clinic, no matter what specialty you choose from. And it's a 50 million outpatient visit our year just for the headache. So that's a huge number of people who have headache. And I'm sure you have all an experience of having a headache, right? So the patient uh, with a headache, uh, concerned about if they have a brain tumor or I have an aneurysm rupture, and it's something really serious disease. So uh, they're concerned that I may have something else going on, and it goes to the doctor's office. And a clinician who sees the patient with a headache, and you think it most likely it's not a serious, but you can't exclude the possibility of a serious condition. So even though chances are very small, but you don't want to miss something, so end up is ordering imaging studies. And it, but there is a great opportunity for evidence-based guidelines so that you don't need to order brain MRI or CT scan for everybody who had a headache because there's a lot of people out there with a headache. Um, so why head hurts, right? So the brain tissue itself has no pain receptor. So no receptors are not exist in a brain tissue. So that's why neurosurgeon can't cut the brain and then patient doesn't say, oh, it hurts, right? So the brain itself doesn't have a pain receptor, but typically the headache or the pain comes around the tissue surrounding a brain, such as uh, meninges, the dura, so a pier arachnoid, or cranial nerve, spinal nerves, or arteries and vein and a muscle, the soft tissue. Those are the places where they have a pain receptor. So oftentimes it's just a headache it come from around the tissue surrounding a brain, brain structures. And uh, the migraine is the most common cause of a headache. Um, the typical migraine patient, we may not see anything on imaging. So even though you do brain MRI, beautiful MRI, you may not find anything uh, in a migraine patient. Uh, and an imaging may not really reveal any cause of a headache. In fact, the, the percentage is very small. So this international classification of a headache disorder, ICHD, actually divide a headache into primary, primary headache and a secondary headache. And a primary headache is where uh, the migraine, tension headache, a cluster headache exists in a primary headache. And then those are the ones who probably may not have any imaging findings. Secondary headache is a type of a headache that we may want to use imaging, such as post-traumatic headache or vascular headache or tumors, infections or stroke or substance withdrawal. So those are the type of a headache that imaging may reveal something, so possibly consider imaging for secondary headache, but not necessarily primary headache. And there's a other kind of, maybe not a headache, but maybe facial pain or cranial neuralgia, some facial pain due to head and a cancer or temporal mandibular joint degenerative disease, 
or something called trigeminal neuralgia that the vessels are compressing and the trigeminal nerve and having an excruciating, a shooting facial pain. And those are different type of uh, pain, but not necessarily headache. Okay, so the primary headache, its most common one is a migraine and the much more common in a woman, relatively younger patients, and usually unilateral and a pulsating quality. So somebody who may have a migraine know what's like. I don't have a migraine, so I don't know, but I have a friends that have a migraine. It's really de uh, devastating conditions because they can't do anything when it happens. And the pain is typically aggravated by the physical activity, and they have a strong photophobia, meaning you can't go outside and having a sunlight, and often associated with a nausea and vomiting. And if you have a no abnormal neurological exam, such as weakness, numbness, tingling, and other things, and then typical imaging is not considered, but if you have a atypical feature or the different quality of the headache in a migraine patient, you would consider imaging as well. Tension headache is the more bilateral pressing tightening quality. And it typically doesn't have any change by physical activity like exercise or weightlifting. And doesn't usually have a photophobia as a nausea vomiting. And it typically, this is also often no neurological examination is normal, uh, so no imaging is often required for the primary headache, either tensions or migraine, unless there are atypical features. Now, this is the study uh, published in JAMA Internal Medicine in 2014. Uh, they look at the National Ambulatory Medical, medical Care Survey. So it's uh, all the outpatient usages of the healthcare resources. So when you're looking at the patient with a headache, certainly there's a over 50 million bit of headache. Uh, and looking at the table here, all of the headache and the total visit is the 51 million, right? And the migraine is almost a half of it, 25 million. And what percentage of a visit has MRI or CT scan or either? It's almost 12.4% of the entire headache, or a primary headache, even 15.6%. Almost 15% of all primary headache patients are getting a MRI or CT scan. And that all total together for imaging use for headache uh, is costing us $3.9 billion. So that's a lot of money for imaging of the headache. And then when you're looking at the trend from two, 1995 all the way to 2010, you can see the percentage of patients who are receiving imaging study is increasing. Uh, from 2009, it's almost 5%, but now 15 and 16%. So I think you can see that why the people really care about who should be getting imaging. Uh, this is an important national uh, discussion. And then how uh, good they are in terms of uh, yield of imaging. Uh, this is the older study from 1996, and then look at the 3,000, over 3,000 cases. And I see how often do you find that something serious, that brain tumor or arterial venous malformations or hydrocephalus or aneurysm. Those are the ones that they worry, right? The patient worry and the clinician worry. So they order imaging study, but actually the incidence of finding serious condition is actually very small. In fact, it's almost like 0.8%, 0.2%, so all together, uh, probably one to 2%. And then stroke is something that we may find, a lacuna infarct, the older stroke, but that's not necessarily causing a headache. So those are incidental kind of older stroke or chronic ischemic processes, but not necessarily reason for headache. So this is just a better view of uh, the, the graph that we show you is about 1.2%, 1 to 2% of abnormality. So the other study also looking at how often do you find any significant imaging findings to explain the patient with a headache. And again, this also another study showing 1.5% had a clinically significant MRI results. 
So again, it's just chances that you find a brain tumor, the aneurysm is actually very, very small. So accordingly, uh, this is the American Academy for Neurology uh, had this kind of like a recommendation on a uh, migraine imaging usually does not show anything. Most of patients with a headache do not need a imaging studies. But what's the most patient, right? It's very difficult to know like uh, when to consider imaging. But generally speaking, American Headache Society, American Academy for Neurology, all recommend the vast majority of patients with a headache do not require the imaging. Uh, another article or the uh, guideline, practice parameter, evidence-based guideline for migraine headache. Uh, again, non-focal chronic headache with no new feature, no atypical feature, do not need imaging. So simple migraine with no focal neurological symptom, you don't need imaging. Uh, even American College of Radiology, even Radiology Society said don't do imaging for uncomplicated headache. So we are not the one that uh, actually ordering study, but we also think it's a lot of a patient with a headache getting imaging studies show nothing. So that yield is very low. And if it's an un un unusual feature, then you don't need to do imaging. So this is more consistent guideline from radiology to neurology to headache society. So imaging for patient with a headache, when to consider imaging? right? Uh, what imaging test to order? So that's the another question. So the primary headache, uncomplicated headache, we don't need imaging, but when to consider imaging? What is the atypical feature? So there are certain lists. For example, this is a sort of a list of when imaging can be considered sudden onset of worst headache of life. You probably heard the terminology worst headache of life. Uh, typically that kind of flag that maybe aneurysm or rapture, maybe the patient has a subarachnoid hemorrhage. Patient who never had a headache, but had a new headache after age 50 is well, a concerning finding. So though I'm not sure that age 50 is a good number. I mean, I feel like maybe 60, but uh, anyway, the, the guidelines say age after 50, new headache, it's uh, something to consider. Uh, because the vast majority of patients usually have a headache before the age 50. Um, position related a headache, worse in standing. So meaning kind of intracranial pressures goes uh, down. And then those are the ones who consider intracranial hypotension. Uh, headache with seizure, headache of fever or sick neph, maybe consider meningi meningitis or some sort of an infectious disease in the brain. Or patient with a history of a cancer or active cancer or immunocompromised status, such as transplant patient, certainly consider imaging. Uh, abnormal neurological examination, such as weakness, numbness, speech difficulty, ataxia, uh, with a headache, certainly consider imaging. And also headache with a recent head trauma patient need imaging. So the Neurology Society has a, something called a SNOOP. <laughs> this is mnemonic for danger sign for headache. And it stands for systemic symptoms such as fever, weight loss, cancer, pregnancy, HIV, immune compromised status, trauma, drug toxicity. So things that we talk about, uh, systemic thing. There's something that a risk factor. N stands for neurological symptoms. So again, somebody who had an abnormal neurological findings or symptom, confusion, impaired mental status, focal neurological symptoms, a sign, a meningismus like a stiff neck or seizures, consider imaging. O, uh, first of all, is an older patient, again, age over 50. And then another second O is an onset is very sudden or acute sudden onset of the headache, worst headache of life. Uh, and then E is the previous headache or history of depression. And the severity, papular edema, um, precipitated by exertion or exercise or positional headache. Those are the ones that P component. So remember SNOOP, those are the kind of things that makes you think that maybe imaging would be useful. Okay. Uh, so what imaging study? You may think it's just a CT and MRI, but there are so many options. 
in fact, a young <laughs> man. Uh, <laughs> bless you. Uh, um, so the imaging, there's uh, so many options to choose from. Uh, the most common one is non-contrast head CT, meaning head CT without contrast. And a brain MRI without contrast, a non-contrast brain MRI, or with and without contrast, meaning you will give a dye or contrast material with MRI to find the area of enhancement, which usually either cancer or infections. Uh, or CT angiogram is the techniques that we use intravenous injection of a dye to see the blood vessels in the head. So that would be a CT angiogram of the brain. Or CT angiogram can be done for the neck vessel, which is a CT angiogram of the neck. Or MR angiogram of the head, which you can actually do with MRI. So to look for blood vessel, for example, um, aneurysm or vascular occlusion or vasculitis. Or MRA of the neck. Same things could be do, uh, can be done with uh, MRI and with and without contrast. And uh, just to remember the head CT with contrast is usually not a useful technique. So acute setting, we tend to do non-contrast head CT. And if the chronic setting or subacute setting, the patients are not acutely ill, MRI may be more useful. But you, typically we don't do non-contrast enhanced as head CT only. All right, so this is sort of like a, um, algorithm or decision tree for the headache. I think a one clear first line is to look for patient had a recent history of a trauma because that way you know the post-traumatic, meaning we're looking for some sort of a blood or a head trauma due to recent injury. So that would be a one pathway. The other non-traumatic headache is typically divided by acute or subacute to chronic. An acute category typically has a, some risk factors, such as people with hypertension, anticoagulation, which usually we worry about intracranial hemorrhage, or sudden severe headache, or something called worst headache life, which we worry about subacranial hemorrhage and aneurysm. Or somebody who is either pregnancy or taking oral contraceptive or looking for more uh, blood clot in the brain. So that would be another pathway. The other is uh, coming with some seizure or neurological symptom uh, or found out. Those are the people who had a different sort of uh, imaging algorithm. But those acute settings, typically we might want to start with a head CT. And a subacute to chronic setting, such as patient with a red flag. Red flag is typically meaning the patient with the history of active cancer or infection, immunocompromised status, HIV, or transplant patient. Um, those patients uh, uh, goes to uh, perhaps more MRI uh, examination. Patient with a papular edema, meaning intracranial pathology is expected. Again, subacute to chronic setting, MRI is more useful. And headache and worsen standing, those are the ones that who most likely have an intracranial hypotension, so that also goes to brain MRI. This is the category that had a migraine, and then there's no uh, atypical feature. Normal neurological examination, the migraine, the patient already known to have a migraine, and then nothing different, then you don't need an imaging. But there's a atypical feature or something, the worsening uh, headache in a migraine patient, you may consider imaging. So those are sort of like a decision trees. Uh, post-traumatic, so let's just start from post-traumatic headache. Somebody who had a fail or you know, the, the car accident typically goes to more emergency room, but a bicycle accident or scooter accident, um, common in a Salt Lake City, uh, you know, typically patient may not really think it's something serious, but then a days later, they got a bad headache. And I think these are the kind of situation you might want to start with non-conscious head CT because it really best test to exclude a significant traumatic brain injury. So small subdural hematoma, subarachnoid hemorrhage, or brain contusion. But the patient came in like, I had a headache. 
And then the trauma was like a month later, two, three months later, or even six months later. Then you may not really see that anything in a hit CT because the blood will disappear or not high density enough to be able to visualize on an unconscious CT scan. That case, we might want to consider brain MRI without contrast to look for evidence of remote traumatic injury. So here's an example, 26 years old male with a headache after a bike accident. Now, typically when you have an actual images like that, that this side is the right side and this is the left side. I don't know you guys know that. May, most likely you guys know that. But this is sort of like how um, axial images are presented in MRI. Uh, this, in radiology, so this side is right and this side is left. Again, notice there's a, some bump in the skull. So he hit the head, a scalp hematoma, and the lacerations. And you can see this a hyperdense subdural hematoma on the left side. And then notice the mass effect in the brain. So you can see there's some uh, cortical cell side or cerebrum fissure on the right side, which is kind of effaced on the left side. And then slightly, there's a midline structure that's shifted to the right side. So those are a subdural hematoma, post-traumatic, and also there's a focal mass effect in midline shift. Now, small subdural hematoma could be seen, um, and then you have to kind of look for it. And you can see along the subdural hematoma, and then this is a tentorium. So you can see the uh, subdural hematoma spreading along the tentorium, just like uh, this amethyst, uh, the diagram. And it could be very thin. Uh, in that case, is you probably don't need to do anything. The neurosurgeon is not going to be excited about the evacuating. But something to look for, because often that those subdural hematoma could increase over time. So you need to keep observations. So you can see the subdural hematoma, very discreet. Blood is a hyper dense on CT scan, because CT scan is kind of dense stometry. So the blood tends to be higher attenuation, white than a brain parenchyma. So you can see on the non-contrast CT scan, you don't need to give a contrast. Non-contrast CT is the best study to do for post-traumatic headache. Now, so, but the trauma is kind of getting older, like a week to two weeks to months. Then a CT scan, the blood may disappear. It may not be as hyper dense as you might see on acute traumatic setting. So, for example, this is a week old trauma, and you could argue maybe there's a something hyper dense, but it's really hard to impress. Like, well, I'm not sure that's really hyper dense, but MRI certainly show there's some evidence of previous hemorrhage with a little, little bit of mild edema around them. And not only that, there's a patient had some sort of a hemorrhage along the phonix, which typically suggestive of sharing injury. And you can see some sharing injury in a gradient echo images, which is most sensitive to detect a blood product. You can see the sharing injury involving a spritinibal corpse callosum. So I think MRI might be more sensitive if the trauma is not super acute and rather weeks to months. Then I think MRI non-contrast would be the better way to go. Now, Take a few minutes to just go over quick brain anatomy because I didn't know how much you learned from the other um, instructor or maybe neurology folks may give you some brain anatomy. So just go through some axial images of the brain from the bottom to up. So you kind of get to know how we see brain structure on the MRI. So this is T2 weighted images, which means the CSF would be bright. So the CSF would be bright on T2-weighted images, and the uh, white matter tend to be a little more darker on a T2-weighted images. So you can see the dark area tend to be white matter um, on a T2-weighted images. You can see this is the hypoglossal canal where the cranial nerve 12 is exiting. You can see the hypoglossal canal. And then this is just sort of a junction of medulla to cervical spinal cord. When you go slightly above, uh, you can see it's kind of like a, the typical feature of medulla oblongata. There's a little bump, the olive nucleus, and then cortical spinal tract to be more ventral surface. And also inferior cerebral peduncle will be seen in a, around the medulla. And you can see jaguar foramen, internal jaguar vein at the skull base, and when you go slightly higher slices, so instead of like a medulla, now it looks like a little bit bigger brainstem, which is pons.
inferior aspect of the pons, you can see the internal auditory canal. So the seventh eighth cranial nerve would be in the IAC. And there's a big band of white matter tract connecting pons and cerebellum. So that's called middle cerebral peduncle. So that's connection between pons and cerebellum. When you go higher cut, now the pons, again, the big belly of the pons, the brain stem, and you can see the dorsal pons. Now, kind of ventral aspect of the fourth ventricle. This is the fourth ventricle. Again, CSF is the bright on T2 by the images. You can see the little bump. This is called facial colliculus. So facial colliculus typically is showing kind of like a global area of abducens nerve nucleus. And then lateral to the pons, you can see the nerve coming out from the lateral side of the pons. This is called systonal segment of the trigeminal nerve. And when you go slightly above, see this a high, the, the configuration, the shape of the fourth ventricle get a little smaller. So this is where you have a still pons. This is the belly of the pons, but then this is the superior cerebral peduncle. And little bump, posterior bump in the uh, pons, a higher cut, would be the uh, inferior colliculus. And then you can see abducens nerve coming out from the ventral aspect of the pons through the uh, drillos canal. So you can see it there. And then this the black signal is the internal carotid artery. So you can see the black vessel tend to be, particularly for arterial structure, tend to be dark on T2 weighted images. And notice slightly high above, the configuration of the brainstem changes almost like uh, um, Mickey Mouse. So this is when you see the Mickey Mouse shape that you are at the level of the midbrain. You see this uh, floorboard or the vessel is the MCA, middle cerebral artery. And this is the branch of a PCA you can see in an um, ambient system. Now slightly going up, you can see the cerebral peduncle. You see that again, the midbrain uh, tegmentum, and you can see this uh, red nucleus, which is a little darker signal in the mid, close to the midline. And when you see this level, the cerebral peduncle, the dorsal aspect is called uh, superior colliculus. This is called quadrigeminal cisterns. And in front of the midbrain, you can see the optic tract, um, which is after this, uh, the optic chiasm, it goes to optic tract. And slightly above the slices would be anterior commissure and a posterior commissure. And you can start seeing um, the basal ganglia region, such as, for example, the, uh, the caudated nucleus, it's a C, and also putamen. And thalamus would be the uh, gray matter structure abutting to the uh, third ventricle. And then the dark area is called globus pallidus, which is kind of because the globus pallidus is containing some iron. So typically, all, um, just regular adult brain, you see some dark signal on the globus pallidus. And immediately lateral to the globus pallidus would be putamen, and then outside of that would be external capsule. So you can see those structure pretty well on t 2 weighted brain MRI images. Now, so that's just a sort of like an overview, quick overview, and I'm sure you have to go through much more detail and later, um, but that gives you some outline of the anatomy on the brain. Okay, so go back to the headache. When you have an acute onset, remember the diagram is an acute onset versus subacute to chronic? So the acute onset of a headache is something that, that we worry uh, intracranial hemorrhage or venous thrombosis. So the best study is probably something to do with a head CT without contrast. Non-contrast head CT is the quickest way to see what's going on in a patient. For example, a patient with a hypertension of anticoagulation, we worry about um, we worry about um, intracranial hemorrhage. So that case is a head CT would be the best study without contrast. Worse the headache life, again, we worry about subarachnoid hemorrhage, aneurysm rapture, so CTA and with a, C, a CT, head CT with CT of the head would be the best way to exclude aneurysm. And a headache in a pregnant woman or oral contraceptive, we worry about deep venous sinus thrombosis. So those cases, we could start from non-contrast head CT 
or we can jump into brain MRI if you worry about the radiation exposure to the pregnant woman. And also headache with seizure or neurological symptom patient, we worry about infections or cancers or toxic mm -hmm. metabolic disease. Again, non-conscious head seat is a good place to start. So let me show you some example. So acute onset of a headache in a patient with a hypertension and anticoagulation, non-conscious CT shows massive intracranial hemorrhage. And those are very common for a hyper patient with a hypertension, particularly for systolic pressure for 200, 230. And this is a, such a patient had an intracranial hemorrhage, kind of centered. Remember, uh, this is the lateral ventricle. So you can see this uh, thalamus, kind of lateral thalamus to globus pallidus to pitamen. This is the big area of intracranial hemorrhage. And you can see some hemorrhage extending into the lateral ventricle, so hyperdensity on the contralateral ventricle. Now, the common location for hypertensive hemorrhage would be putamen, external capsule, basal ganglia region. That's pretty much 60% of all hypertensive hemorrhage. And occasionally, you may see some thalamus, pons, and acetabellum. Now, subcortical white matter would be very unusual location to have a hemorrhage due to hypertension. Just keep in mind. This is another patient with this, uh, hypertensive hemorrhage. You can see there's a hemorrhage center in a posterior aspect of the thalamus with the extension into the lateral ventricle. Um, so, again, somebody who has a high blood pressure or uh, anticoagulation tend to have intracranial hemorrhage. So somebody who has that with an acute onset of a headache and non-conscious head CT is the best way to go. We often measured um, the volume of the hematoma, which actually correlated with um, prognosis. Uh, second category on this set is a worst head of life. Again, this is the buzzword to worry about intracranial aneurysm rupture. Um, and then this is a patient, 48 years old, with sudden onset of the worst head of life. And again, this is a non contour CT scan showing kind of slight the hyperdensity in a mid line structure just anterior to the third ventricle. And also the lateral ventricle had a little sediment of a high signal. So if you see that, that means the patient already had a subragonal hemorrhage, kind of like a pulling into the lateral ventricle. So most of the time that we do CTA of the head, not a neck, but a head at the same time, we used to do like a lumbar puncture and find a subragonal hemorrhage and go back to CTA. But if you do CTA and exclude the aneurysm, you don't need to do lumbar puncture. So the patient prefer to do it. And also ED physician don't have a time to do lumbar puncture or perhaps not easy to do lumbar puncture in a setting. So we tend to do CTA of the head altogether. So this is the CTA. You can see this uh, aneurysm in an anterior communicating artery. This is the A1 segment of an anterior cerebral artery on the right. And this is the left side. So this is the kind of region of anterior communicating artery. So you find the aneurysm. And this is a patient who had an ACOM aneurysm rupture and it presented with acute onset of worst headache life. Now, uh, another patient with a worst head of life, again, left side of the weakness, you can see this non contra CT scan with a sub hemorrhage deep into the cerebrum fissure, slightly more on the right side, but on the left side, the cerebrum fissure also has a some sub hemorrhage. You can see along the ambient system as well. So if you do CTA of the head, you can find the MCA aneurysm. Right, this is the MCA aneurysm, and also there's a different density of the hematoma, which is typically indicative of some of the active bleeding. So there is a, some clot, but then there's a in, in giving a contrast to give you a more brighter. And then when you see this pooling of the contrast as you use scan from CTA, that suggests a, a more like active extravasation or bleeding. So this is a, something that you want to pick up the phone and then call uh, either neurosurgeon or the uh, ED doctors not to put in a report. This is something that requires a phone call. Um, the other category, the headache in a pregnant woman, oral contraceptive. In this case, we exclude the draw venous sinus thrombosis. This is a serious disease and you don't want to miss it because you could 
hurt someone if you miss. And again, as I said, it could be a head CT non-conscious the brain MRI to start. Pregnant women don't get contrast for the MRI because the gathering them, we don't know how sick that is. So if you know the patient is pregnant, we don't give a contrast for the MRI. Although we do give a contrast for the uh, CT scan, which is uh, known to be sick. Okay, so this is a patient, 25 years old, otherwise healthy, but patient was on contra oral contraceptive, which probably didn't know at the time of CT scan. Now, the CT scan may not look that abnormal at the first sight, but you can see high signal on this kind of dorsal aspect of the midbrain. I'm sorry, my cat is meowing. Uh, and then posterior aspect of the uh, posterior fossa, you can see along the transverse sinus, there's a high density. So whenever you see high density on a CT scan, you have to worry about possible clot or blood. And this is the actually um, venous sinus thrombosis in the, the transverse sinus and also superior sagittal sinus. MRI in the acute setting, the blood may not be hyperdense on a, a T1 word and imagery. So these are all clot in a superior cell cell sinuses. But unless it's subacute stage, it doesn't turn on a high signal on the MRI. You have to be aware. Uh, so this is the transvenous sinus thrombosis in a patient with oral contraceptive. Now, this is another patient, 20 years old, a young girl with a headache and nausea vomiting and was transferred from outside a hospital. This is the outside of head CT. Patient had a hypodense on the left or temporal lobe, um, but they didn't really see that clot in the superior cell, cell sinus. And also there's a post-contrast study showing an empty delta sign because it's a clot. Um, but this was diagnosed as the herpes encephalitis. So the patient was treated and a herpes uh, encephalitis, but didn't get better. And then transferred to um, Harborview Medical Center, which is affiliated with University of Washington, where I was working. And MRI diffusion really didn't show any restricted diffusion, but you can see this uh, clot all the way to superior sagittal sinuses. And then two days later, this is how the brain swollen so much. Uh, and being a sign of thrombosis, if you not diagnose correctly, the patient could go down pretty badly. So it's a very scary disease, uh, I would tell my resident. And the brain swollen, so all the cell sides are very tight. And also you can see this area of a hemorrhage. Venous infarction tend to have a more intracranial hemorrhage. And initially it looks like a vasogenic edema. So when you have a, somebody who is young, but could be pregnant or contraceptive or hyperclogitable state, like a sickle cell, polycythemia, you really have to think it could be a venous sinus thrombosis. This is really scary disease. And it could be seen in a dehydration in an elderly patient or a newborn baby. Uh, you may find a patient with a cancer malignancy, maybe hypercoagulable. So this is something you have to keep in mind. And then the scary thing is, is a patient had a non-specific clinical presentation. So the symptom may not really guide it to the one way or the other. So the clinical history is very important. Now, the last category for acute onset would be headache with seizure or neurological symptoms. So in this case, you're looking for infection, tumor, or any toxic metabolic disease. Again, non-contest head seat is a good place to start. And this is just one example. There's a headache and seizure and a mental status change. And you can see high signal along the mesial temporal lobe. Um, and you can see MRI, there's a little blood product which is dark on T2-weighted images with adjacent basogenic edema. When you give a contrast, you see the enhancement of the mesial temporal lobe. And this is a patient with a herpes encephalitis. So mesial temporal lobe involvement with a hemorrhagic enhancement is a classic appearance for herpes encephalitis. Okay. Sorry, my cat is meowing. Um, so subacute to chronic hemorrhage. So the other category, the patient presented more subacute to chronic hemorrhage, 
patient with um, either red flag or okay cancer or immunocompromised status or IV drug abuse or high risk for infection. Those are the patients who might start with the MRI because the CT scan may not be sensitive enough. And also the other category would be a patient with a papular edema or visual changes. Um, this could be uh, all kind of things. It could be tumor, it could be deep venous dual venous thrombosis or intracranial hypertension. Again, brain MRI is a good place to start. Um, and also the other category would be headache, worse than standing, and nausea, vomiting. In this case, we will worry about intracranial hypotension, which could be a CSF leak. Now, so just an example, this is a patient who presents with a left temporal headache. And this is a post-contrast T1-weighted axial image and coronal images. Notice there's a, some kind of leptomeningeal thickening and enhancement in the left temporal region, extending to the occipital lobe, and also the focal area of enhancement in the brain, not only a cerebral hemisphere, but a, a posterior fossa cerebellum on the right side. And it turned out this patient had a lung cancer. So this is lung cancer metastasis with leptomeningeal spread of the cancer and present with a headache. The other patient is a lung history of lung transplant, presented with a headache and nausea, vomiting. And non contra CT scan wasn't that impressive. But notice this uh, posterior fossa, you see some asymmetry. The false ventricle looks a little bit more kind of compressed on the right side. And this seems to be an area of a hyperdensity. And there's a little bit of hyperdensity on the um, um, the left of frontal uh, deep white matter as well. So we kind of recommend that getting a brain MRI on this patient because it's not quite normal. And obviously, we didn't know, but the transplant patients tend to have a more uh, worse outcome for infections and cancer. So the patient was admitted, and then this is the next day uh, head CT. See this, how much more mass effect in the occipital posterior fossa. You can't really see the false ventricle anymore because of the hypodensity and the mass effect. And then you start noticing some area about hypodensity and the caudate head on the left side or um, posterior basal ganglia lesion. Uh, on the, the, the right side. So quite a bit of a changes within that day. So the MRI really showed the extensive area of T2 flare hyperintensity. And this patient turns out disseminated aspergillus infection with septic emboli. Um, and then the transplant patient tend to have a really bad infection if that happened, and it, 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 you have to have a high clinical suspicious to see something is going on. Those are the really fast spread of infections. The post contrast study may not show the enhancement because it's so fast. The spread in an immune system, immune function is so um, impaired, and then they'll be able to form the enhancement. So that's something to keep in mind. Another patient with just a, a 45 year old with a headache and earache. You can see this temporal bone CT scan have a, some soft tissue opacification in middle ear cavity and master their cells. But the bone margin is irregular. So there's a bone destruction in the middle ear cavity in the mastoid. So worry about ear infection, otomastoiditis. And an MRI study done a few days later showing already brain abscess developing due to ear infection. See this posterior uh, a border of petrous bone is destroyed, and infection was uh, spreading uh, through the um, transverse sinuses and sigmoidal sinus region, and then creating a brain abscess. So something to keep in mind. Another patient, this is really the scary story, uh, was old middle-aged man with a severe headache after hair implant. So whatever the reason, he's got disseminated meningitis. This is all abnormal leptomeningeal enhancement and also focal area of a collection, uh, subdural empyema and a ventriculitis. So that all this infection came from hair implants. So that's scary. Uh, another patient with a right frontal recurrent headache. 
And notice there's a sun hematoma surrounded by the area of hyperdensity, kind of different kind of subacute chronic age of a hematoma. And then we did an angiogram because of the, uh, we didn't know what was wrong with this patient. And it ended up is having very beaded, irregular appearance of the ACA branches. You can see that. And uh, also some of the posterior uh, cerebral artery branches. So this patient had um, a vasculitis due to amphetamine use. So drug-induced vasculitis is not uncommon, and you might want to think about that when you have a certain sort of a background. Um, papillo edema, vision loss, this is something that we have to worry that possibly intracranial mass lesion. So persistent headache, developed a fever, altered mental status, and this is the patient with brain abscess in a, the right to left cardiac shunt. Uh, and also, sometimes we see more commonly in the middle age obese patient, as patient BMI 42. And a brain MRI finding is very interesting. There's a, some subtle enhancement around the optic nerve sheath. And also, optic nerve disc right there in the dorsal aspect of the globe is kind of protruding. And also, CSF signal surrounding optic nerve is very prominent. And this is a finding of the idiopathic intracranial hypertension, or so called the pseudo tumor cerebri. And when you have those patients who typically present with a very bad headache, you may see empty cella uh, because of the increase of pressure pressing the pituitary gland to the floor. And this is a, something that you may be able to tell um, based on the imaging appearance that the patient may have intracranial hypertension. You can do lumbar puncture to assume this uh, um, measure the pr uh, pressure, opening pressure of the uh, spinal canal. The other side is a worse headache in standing or nausea vomiting. So in this case, it's more looking for intracranial hypotension, which is more sagging the brain. So because the pressure is so low that at the whole brain stem is sagging down to the from and magnum, you may find that kind of like a depressing or the every brain stem is kind of shifting down toward the from and magnum. And you may find uh, enlarged pituitary gland because of the, the vein, venous structures are distended. And also, contrary to intracranial hypertension, hypotension, the pituitary gland get bigger. So you can see the enlarged pituitary gland or drill enhancement or enlarged the venous structure, such as the superior orbital vein, like this, bilateral. And these are the findings for intracranial hypotension, meaning there may be some CSF leak elsewhere. And if there's somebody who had a lumbar puncture for whatever the reason, that blood patch would be a good place to start. And if you don't know the, where the CSF leak is, you may do a whole body myogram to find the CSF leak. So this is a little unusual situation, but actually we see this quite often in a practice. So think about if the whole brain is sagging down and then the pons is kind of up against the uh, dorsal clibus, there's something to think about with the intracranial hypotension for somebody who had a CSF leak. Again, just to summarize the migraine, we don't really know need to do imaging, although I show a bunch of cases that are kind of scary, so I don't want you to feel like you have to get all this imaging study, but if the patient had a classic migraine, Again, we don't need imaging. And think about danger sign of a SNOOP, systemic symptoms, fever, weight loss, cancer, pregnancy, HIV. Those are really the risk factors. So you may have a something serious. Um, and neurological symptoms, somebody who had ataxia, confusion, impaired mental status, or weakness, uh, numbness, meningismus, seizure. Again, you, you have to image those patients. Older patient and also sudden onset is another piece. Previous headache history and progression or worsening intensity or severity is another worst, uh, concerning findings. Papillo edema, it's sort of a fundoscope. I think an ED physician can do it or a neuro ophthalmologist will do it. Um, precepted by the exertion or exercise and positional headache. Those are the kind of snoop. <laughs> pneumonic, so you have to keep in mind if you have one of those, consider imaging.
And then choice of imaging to summarize, acute onset of post-traumatic headache is non-contrast head CT is the best test to do. But for patients with subacute to chronic headache, perhaps the MRI is more sensitive to detect some abnormality than CT scan. In particular, for patients with a red flag or somebody who had a cancer, a transplant, we see this all the time in academic medical center, brain MRI with and without contrast would be the best test to do. And keep in mind that clinical history is very critical. You have to know the patient is either pregnant, oral contraceptive, or sickle cell. Those clinical information is very critical to guiding one way or the other. Um, so any questions? I think we have a few minutes left for the quiz. No? I have a question. Okay. Um, uh, I've never really been understood totally when it's okay, when it's needed to get contrast for an MRI scan. Mm -hmm. Uh, what and then in, in the context of headache, is there ever a time when we would want to get uh, contrast for an MRI? I, I know you did discuss that, but um, yeah, just in general, right. what what does contrast on MRI help us see on a on a brain scan? I think uh, uh, in the context of a headache. Um, if the patient has a history of a cancer, like a breast cancer, a lung cancer, or something that you worry about, um, brain metastasis, <laughs> excuse me, um, I think that that's a contrast would be very useful. Um, otherwise, I think you can do non-contrast study. Uh, there's a lot of sort of good, um, people who tend to overuse contrast over, um, why, well, since you're going to do MRI, we want to do with and without contrast. But uh, in fact, unless you have an active cancer or worry about infection, you don't need to do contrast. Um, I don't think a stroke is the patient who presents with a headache. But for example, stroke or post-traumatic brain injury, we don't need to give a contrast. Nothing is going to enhance. So most likely, if you do non-contrast study, would be the best way to do. So it's really the contrast usage is, is for something active cancer, active infection, the worry about some sort of a spread of the brain abscess. Well, um, septic emboli and stuff like that. Then, then I think you can do contrast. But other than that, I think a non-contrast study would be fine for a headache. Okay. Thank you. All right. So the quiz number one. I think you're supposed to send a question uh, answer to the Serena, but I don't know that may not be happening today because the, somebody's taking tests today. Anyway, advanced imaging is often performed for patients with a headache. What is the likelihood of discovering the cause of patients' headache? Number one, 50%. Number two, 25%. Number three, 5%. Number four, 1 to 2%. Number five, 0.1%. You guys got that? <laughs> Which is the answer? Uh, four, one to two percent. Excellent. All right. Which is the following condition? Which of the following conditions several academic society recommend study? Number one, cancer patient present with acute headache. Number two, HIV patient with slowly progressive headache. Number three, older patient present with a headache and seizure. Number four, patient with a history of hypertension present with acute severe headache. Number five, young patient with a history of migraine with normal neurological examination. Which one is not doing good to recommend MRI? Pretty simple, right? Five. Five. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you for your participation. All right, quiz number three. Which imaging test best suited for the patient present in the emergency room was worse the headache of life? Now, number one, brain MRI with and without contrast. Number two, non-contrast head CT. Oh, no, I'm sorry. Number two, head CT with contrast. Number three, head CT without contrast with a CT angiogram of the head. Number four, head CT with and without contrast, and a CT angiogram of the head and neck. 
And number five, just go straight to the cerebral angiogram. Which one do you think is the best? I would say three. Three? Oh, good. Excellent. That's a good one. So this is a little tricky, but I think uh, when you have a worry about intracranial aneurysm rapture in this kind of worst to hit a life, CT angiogram of the head is fine. You don't need to do neck. CTA, but if next CTA is typically needed for stroke patient or trauma patient, worry about dissection, you do hit a neck CTA, but hip bleed or suspecting intracranial hemorrhage, I think a hit CTA is just fine. Don't need to do neck. So that's the that's the trick. And non concert hit CT is to just to see subarachnoid hemorrhage and a CTA of the head. So you don't need to do neck CTA. Perfect. Wonderful. Number four, which anatomical location is hypertensive hemorrhage least common? Number one, subcortical white matter. Number two, thalamus. Number three, uh, cutamen. Number four, pons. Number five, cerebellum. Which one do you think least common? Subcortical white matter, number one. Wonderful, wonderful, thank you. Now I hear somebody else, a woman's voice. Wonderful. Number five. It's so bad, I can't say. <laughs> <laughs> number five, dual venous sinus thrombosis this should be suspected in the following patient. One, a pregnant woman. Number two, a young woman taking oral contraceptive. Number three, older patient with dehydration. Number four, one and a two. Number five, all of above. I think it's all of them. All of them, exactly. And I think in addition to that, you can think about like a sickle cell, polycythemia, cancer patient, hypercoagulable state. Dual venous sinus thrombosis is a scary disease. If you miss it, you could kill someone. So I always put that in a lecture for resident students. Again. So I think that's pretty much all. Um, any question? I think this is just showing all this answer. You guys get everything right. Perfect. <laughs> I have a question. Yes. So um, did you not want us to email in the answer? I mean, you already went through the answers. Do we not need to email them in then? Um, because I was told that somebody was not able to take this class because of, oh, you could actually send it. <laughs> hey, it's Jeff Olpin here, and I'd prefer you to send the answers. That would be terrific, so that we kind of know that you're there. It's kind of a way of us taking role. Oh, I see. Attend Does that sound okay? Yeah, yeah, that sounds good. Yes, Thank uh, you. I didn't know that what was the right thing to do, but you probably wanted to know the answer anyway for those calls. That's right. Right. <laughs> that was great, Yoshimi. Thank you. Oh, wonderful. Great. Yeah. Thank you so much. And if you have any question later, just feel free to email me um, my full name and at hsc at utah.edu. All right. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye.